Everybody, it is great to get to be here and dive in with you today. Last week, I heard someone say that looking at a table for an hour makes them really hungry. So I hope you ate before you came. We even put some bread on it this week, so now you can really be hungry. But tables make us think of all sorts of things. We think of wonderful meals we've shared or great memories. And as I've, I've been considering the table, I've been considering whose table do I love to be around? So that's my question for you today. Whose table do you love to be around? Maybe it's a place where you know that you will always get an incredible meal. I know Brad and I, we have a short list of people that we have an unspoken rule. If they invite us over, even if we have plans, we cancel them because we know the meal is going to be amazing. The hospitality and environment, incredible. Maybe for you, it's a table where you've shared beautiful memories, years of laughter and celebration and games. And every time you're at that table, you feel like you're home. Or maybe in your house, you have a ritual of going to a certain restaurant for a milestone or marker moment. And that particular table, you've had really significant conversations. As if I've thought about whose table I love to be around, a few jumped out right away, but one in particular. I love to be at my grandma's table. My grandma is an incredible woman. She's a 93-year-old, 4'10", Italian immigrant. And I love her so much. She is as strong as she is kind. And for as long as I can remember, I have loved to be around her table. Because for one thing, the food is always amazing. I remember as a kid being so amazed because she never even used a recipe. In fact, she never even used a bowl. So often she would just put the flour and eggs right on the counter and out would come this incredible pasta. And then when we'd sit down to the meal, It was like the miracle of the loaves and fishes because the food just kept coming and coming and coming. And she kept telling us to eat and eat and eat. And she would always send us home with more food than we could carry. From the moment we pulled into the driveway, we knew that her table was ready for us because we could smell the sauce before we even stepped foot in the front door. Early on in our relationship, Brad and I had a pretty pivotal moment because he suggested that we should go to the Olive Garden for dinner. He only made that mistake once because I don't care how many free breadsticks and salad they give you. After you've tasted real Italian, you will never settle for imitation. And so I could not wait for him to come to my grandma's table and introduce him to the magic of old world cooking. And I let him know at grandma's table, there is just one rule. You always come hungry and you always leave full. That table holds a lot of core memories for me birthdays and holidays and sleepovers and really the amazing food, it was just a bonus. Because at that table, my grandma wasn't just feeding me. She was filling me. Every time I was at her house, I felt so known and loved. And to this day, I still believe I'm her favorite. (laughs) And even at 93 years old, She has this incredible way of making you feel like you're the most brilliant, most beautiful, most talented, most interesting person in the room. And as I've gotten older, I've realized she put just as much energy into feeding me as she did filling me. And that's the principle of the table. The best tables are the ones where we are both fed and filled. Think about it, most tables feed us. Most tables meet a physical need for food, but only some tables fill us. Only some tables satisfy that need for connection and love and hope. So whose table do you love to be around? I bet it's a place where you are both fed and filled. Do you remember your high school cafeteria? I do. Painfully well, in fact. And I bet if today I walked into Peters Township High School, I could point out the table I sat at in ninth grade. And I could also point out the table I aspired to sit at. Because in ninth grade, I was new to the district and I sort of just ended up at this cafeteria table with what I felt were a bunch of misfits. And that lunch period was the longest 50 minutes of the day. But there was a table that I believe could fill me. That if I could just score a seat at that table, Then I would feel like I measured up. Then I would have friends. Then maybe the boy I had a crush on would give me more intention. That table could make all of my social woes disappear. And I'm happy to report that by the end of ninth grade, I achieved a seat at that table. And boy, did it feel good for a minute and only a minute. 
because I quickly realized the disappointing truth that a seat at that table meant my life got a whole lot more exhausting because now I had to prove that I belonged at that table and I had to work really hard to measure up and show that I was cool enough and good enough and I had to think really hard about what I wore and what I did and what I said. The thing that I thought would fill me only left me more empty. If you're here today and you're in middle or high school and you're just longing for a seat at the table, you're not alone. Let me let you in on a little secret. Us adults, we're still just hoping for a seat at a table that we think can fill us. Some of us just think if we could be at a table across from a person, dating or in a relationship, then we would finally feel that significance that we long for because right now, it just feels like life is passing us by. Or others of us, we're longing to break into a certain social circle. That if we could go to those events or be on that text thread, then we would have that acceptance that we crave. Then we wouldn't open up our phone tonight at the end of the weekend and see the rejection from all of the events we weren't invited to. For others of us, we believe that if we could just be at the right happy hour or dinner with the right clients and the right executives sealing the right deal, then we would be secure because our careers would take off. We wouldn't have to worry anymore. All of us are looking for a seat at a table to fill us, but the ironic thing is those tables will only leave us more empty. Because just like in a high school cafeteria, we are left trying to prove ourselves and measure up and be good enough. And if we're really honest, deep down, it's a really terrible way to live. But Jesus offers us a better way, a different table, a seat at his table, one that we don't have to earn or measure up for or be good enough for, one that has our name on it that's just waiting for us. And here's the thing, when we come to the table with Jesus, we are always fed and filled. And so throughout this series, we've been looking at Jesus and meals, how Jesus did ministry around the table. And what we've seen as we've dug into the gospels is that Jesus is always feeding and filling. He's feeding, he's meeting physical needs, but even more significantly and amazingly, he's, he's filling. He's meeting deep core needs, spiritual needs. And that's exactly what we're gonna see continue today. We're gonna be in John chapter two, where Jesus is at a wedding. You can go ahead and navigate there. John writes, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, AKA when they're drunk, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And the disciples, believed in him. So what's the significance of this account? Is Jesus just doing a favor for his mom, Mary? Is he testing out his supernatural power with a really cool party trick? John gives us the key to unlocking the significance in that last summary sentence. He said, this is a sign where Jesus manifested his glory and it led to belief. The disciples believed. Many of us, if we've been around the church, we know this is Jesus's first miracle or the miracle of turning water into wine. And most of the gospel writers, they use the word miracle really often. It's the Greek word power that we translate miracle. And that word miracle is the visible display of God's supernatural energy and work. But John doesn't use the word miracle. He uses the word sign because it's a display of God's miraculous power that points to something greater. And John is all about signs and glory. In fact, it's how he structures his book. The first 12 chapters are seven signs that Jesus did. And the last eight chapters are the fullness of the revelation of his glory. 
But John doesn't just pick seven random signs and hope for the best. He did it really purposefully. And he clues us in as to why at the end of his book, he writes, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote down a historical account of a wedding so that we over 2000 years later could believe and have life in his name. Believing means that we are trusting that Jesus is the only one who can fill us and life in his name is the freedom found in living in that reality that we are filled. And so yes, John is writing a historical account of a wedding, but in a way, He's giving us a parable. He's showing us a sign, something that points to something greater, how Jesus feeds and fills. And there's four things that really stand out to me when I think about this idea of feeding and filling. The first one is that Jesus feeds specifically. So the wedding industry in the United States is valued at over $70 billion. And the average cost of a wedding is $29,000, but way more in most major cities. And that's not even counting all of the expenses of everything else we've added to weddings, like engagement pictures and engagement parties and week-long bachelor trips. If you've ever been invited to be in a wedding, you know that that invitation comes with a hefty price tag. Because for us, weddings are a big investment and a big deal. But that's not really unique to our time and culture. In fact, in the ancient Near East, when Jesus lived, weddings were even more of a big deal because weddings weren't just a day long celebration. They were a week long celebration and they weren't just for your friends and family, they were for the entire village. And so an entire village would feast and drink together for a week and the bride's family didn't foot the bill, the groom's family did, which some of you maybe think is a pretty good deal if you have daughters. And it was an honor shame culture. And so being hospitable and offering a lavish feast with plenty to drink was a form of bringing honor to the groom's family and honor to the marriage. But something like running out of wine, it wasn't just like an annoying embarrassment. It meant years of shame and devastation, both for the groom's family and for the couple. The bride's family could actually even sue the groom's family for something like running out of wine. And so when Mary comes running up to Jesus, she's not just casually saying like, hey Jesus, would you mind running into town and grabbing a few more bottles because I think we're gonna run out. No, you can feel the panic in her voice because she's saying this marriage that's just days old is on the brink of disaster. And to find that much wine and save them from that kind of shame, that's a near impossibility. And so she asks Jesus to act. But if you think about it, should the son of God, who's experienced all of the glory of heaven, who was present at creation, should he care about something so small and so trivial as some unimportant couple from a small town in their social standing? Like, is he really gonna use his supernatural power for something this small, even profane? I mean, most of the guests were already drunk. It makes sense to us that Jesus would use his power to do miracles and to heal people. It's loving. And it makes sense to us that Jesus would even do something to manifest his power, like walk on water so that people could see he was the son of God. But wine at a wedding? Is that really on Jesus' job description? Like, is he really concerned with something that small? Our modern rational minds think, no, God's not concerned with those kind of things. Jesus cares about really big life decisions. And Jesus cares when our relationships are in deep turmoil and struggle. And Jesus cares about our eternal destiny. But he doesn't care about small things. But what we see in this account is Jesus's invitation to bring him everything, that he is in the details, that Jesus feeds specifically, that there is nothing too small to bring to him. That means Jesus cares about things like math tests, and soccer tryouts, and your big meeting at work tomorrow, and how you spend your free time. Is there something right now that's just bringing you a lot of stress and anxiety? It's not the biggest deal, but it's just this kind of quiet hum in the back of your mental load. And yeah, it's not nearly as bad as what a lot of people are dealing with. Have you brought that to Jesus? Are you willing to invite him into the details of your life and say, hey Jesus, 
we have no more wine. He wants you to. Because you know what happens when we begin to operate like Jesus feeds specifically? We get to know Jesus intimately because we see him provide not just in those big moments that we talk to him about, but in the small moments again and again and again. It will transform your relationship with Jesus. Bring him in to the details of your life. Jesus feeds specifically. The second thing we see is that Jesus feeds with authority. And so Mary brings Jesus into the details of her life as she comes to him. But then they have this kind of weird exchange. He says, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. I don't know about you, but if any man in my house called me woman, it's not going to end too well. But Jesus, he's not being derogatory. He is not being belittling, but he is being cold. He's creating purposeful distance between him and Mary. It'd be like the modern equivalent of calling your mom ma'am. It's polite, but he's setting up a framework for their relationship because yes, Mary is his mother, but Jesus is Mary's Lord. And just like everyone else, Mary will need to learn to come under his authority. And when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, what he's saying is my death, my time for my death has not yet come. Because Jesus is here to do the will of his father, the mission his father gave him to complete. And Jesus and the father, they are always in lockstep because they are one. And so Jesus only does what the father tells him to do. And so when he says my hour has not yet come, but goes and has, go ahead and does the miracle, is he just like giving in to Mary? No, he's always obedient to the will of his father. What we see here is a principle of Jesus's authority that he's establishing. He's saying that no human agenda or advice or manipulation is gonna influence the way he acts because he's acting in accordance with the Father. So often we're willing to bring Jesus our needs, but we're not willing to come under his authority. And though we never actually say it out loud, we think that we can bargain or manipulate Jesus into doing what we want. We say, Jesus, if you would just make this relationship work out, then I promise I'll go to church every single week. Like I won't even miss if I'm sick. Or Jesus, I kept my end of the bargain. I gave that money to the church like they were asking. And so now I expect that I'm gonna get this promotion because I deserve it. I earned it. That's the way we work, right? Or Jesus, I promise. I promise I will stop getting drunk every single weekend. If you just answer this prayer, Jesus, look, look how much faith I have. You have to act. You have to heal. We try to bargain and manipulate. Sometimes we even take it a step further. We try to appeal to favoritism and say, God, look how good my family is. We all love you. People have served you for generations. God, I'm, I'm doing so much ministry. You have to make things work out. But Jesus doesn't work that way. Jesus is only doing the will of his father. Later in the book of John, Jesus says about himself, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then later he goes on, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus is about the will of his father and the will of his father is that we would have eternal abundant life. And that is how Jesus acts. But I think this exchange between him and Mary is so instructive because Mary comes to him with the need. She brings him into the detail. She says, Jesus, we have no more wine. But then Jesus doesn't respond the way that she hoped or expected. And what does Mary do? Does she get mad? Does she walk away? Does she throw in the towel? No. Even though Jesus doesn't respond as she expected, Mary doubles down on her faith. She says to the servants, you do whatever it is he tells you because she trusts him to act. We see in Mary the kind of double-fisted faith that we can have, that on one hand, we bring Jesus our, our needs and our hopes and our fears, and we ask him to act on our behalf. And then on the other hand, when he doesn't respond like we hope or expect or in a way that makes sense, we double down on our faith. We say, Jesus, I still trust you because I know you are following your father's will and it's gonna be for my good, my abundant life and your glory. So Jesus feeds specifically, Jesus feeds with authority and Jesus fills completely. 
I'm not sure if you caught it or not, but there was some pretty big news this week. In a Grammy acceptance speech, Taylor Swift announced that her 11th album would be dropping this April. <laughs> and Swifties everywhere rejoiced, and everybody else rolled their eyes. You know who you are if you're a hater. But immediately, Taylor Swift fans took to the internet with all of their theories and conspiracy ideas and trying to figure out what exactly is happening because Taylor Swift is known for Easter eggs. She's known for a deeper meaning behind what she does and wears and says and, and when she does it. And part of the thrill of being a Swifty is trying to uncover what that deeper meaning is, not just taking things that she does at surface value, but trying to figure out the message that she's really trying to convey. We have to approach the gospel of John like a Swifty. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I'm not being heretical. Think about it. There is a physical dimension to what John is saying. He is giving us a historical eyewitness account of physical realities of the life of Jesus. And that is important. But John's really good at Easter eggs because throughout his whole gospel, he's also trying to convey a spiritual reality. The signs he chose and the details he chose, chose to share are a, for a reason. So we would understand the deeper message that he's trying to convey. And we see that in this account. Look at how he describes the miracle. He said, now there are six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Jesus could have made wine however he wanted. He could have chosen the jars that brought the original wine and just filled them back up with wine. He could have snapped his fingers and had wine rain down from heaven. But Jesus did something really significant. He looked around the room and found the one thing that represented the old covenant, the way of Judaism, purification jars used for cleansing rituals, purification rituals from the Jews, their way of making themselves clean. These jars represented the old Jewish law and custom. And in a sense, what Jesus is saying by filling these jars is that way of religion of cleaning yourself up, of having to be good enough for God, it's done. I'm gonna bring it to completion. I'm going to fill it to the brim. And now you won't find purification through a system, but through my blood on the cross. Jesus takes religious jars and fills them with his new wine. And what he's doing, Jesus is offering us a chance to exchange performance per, for provision. He's saying, despite what you think, you don't have to be good enough for God. You don't have to have your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to make yourself pay for the shame that you feel. That system of performance, it is done. And now I'm ushering in a new way, a new wine of provision in the ancient world. Wine represents joy, abundance, and celebration and goodness. And Jesus saying, drink this wine because you'll have all of those things because I'm going to make you pure. I'm gonna provide a way for your atonement. What Jesus is saying by choosing Jewish purification jars is I'm going to satisfy your thirst for God in a whole new way that I am the new wine that will feed you and fill you so that you are never thirsty again. When Jesus fills us, he fills us completely. And he also fills us abundantly. This is the last thing that we see. Often when we're trying to figure out someone's personality, we'll say, are you a glass half full person or a glass half empty person? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? But when it comes to considering our life with Jesus, we have to ask a different question. We have to say, am I a glass half full person or am I a glass overflowing person. Because there's a difference. Often when we approach our relationship with Jesus, we think it looks like this, that yes, he fills us just like this. There's some blessings we can enjoy as being followers of Jesus. There's some truth we can live into, but there's still a big gap between the wine and the top of the glass. And so I need to work really hard to find things to fill this. It means that we're living a glass half full faith, but Jesus is saying, that's not what I have for you. That's not what it means to be my followers. To be my followers, you have a glass overflowing faith. 
You have a faith where my word has caught fire in your soul so deeply that it becomes real and it fills you up to overflowing. Let me give you an example. When I'm living a glass half full faith, I know that I am chosen and that I am accepted and I am loved by God. But functionally, I live like that only filled me halfway, but I still need the applause and the approval from other people to fill my cup the rest of the way. That's a glass half full faith. But Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you to greater abundance. Look at the wine that Jesus provided at the wedding. It was abundant in both quantity and quality. Based on the size of those jars, Jesus would have made upwards of 120 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine. Way more than even a whole village could drink at the rest of that wedding. And it was also the best quality. The banquet master said, this is better than the best wine that was served. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. A life of abundance in both quantity, that we will live abundant life eternally forever, that death will never hold us but also in quality that the life we live here and now would be a full glass that would transform everything about us because we're living out of the abundance and the fullness of what it means to be in Jesus. And John gives us a really incredible picture of what that looks like because all throughout the book of John is this theme of abundance. And so he said, as a glass overflowing person, your glass will overflow with grace. Because in his fullness, we have received grace upon grace, grace in abundance, grace to cover every single sin, grace that is all sufficient, even in your darkest hour. And if you're a glass overflowing person, Jesus says that I, my joy will be in you and that your joy may be full. But no matter what is going on up here in your life, underneath is this undercurrent of joy that cannot be shaken because your glass is full. And beyond that, Jesus says, you will have life and you will have it to the full. You will have it abundantly. You will have significance and purpose and acceptance that will all be filled in me. Jesus is offering us a life of abundance because filled people are free people. We're free from chasing after those tables that we think will fill us. And we no longer have to perform and measure up and achieve. And we're not just stuck living under the fear of man, just hoping that we can achieve someone's approval or applause. Filled people, they don't hold on to offenses. Filled people don't harbor unforgiveness. If you're a filled person, people's words might sting you, but they will not scar you because your glass is full with the truth that you have everything you need always and forever in Jesus. When Jesus fills us, he fills us abundantly. So what does this look like at our tables? How do we translate the feeding and filling that Jesus gives to how we live? Well, as followers of Jesus, we do likewise. We feed and fill. We don't just give people food, we give them a meal. Think about it like this. My kids love Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. So we go there frequently and every time we pull into the parking lot, a discussion breaks out. Are we going to eat in the dining room or going to eat in the car? And my kids think the dining room is far superior. So they start a lobbying campaign for us to eat inside. And in my head, I'm thinking, no way. The whole point we came here is so that it could be quick and easy. We are not going in that dining room. But what they're really asking is, mom, are you going to feed us or are you going to fill us? Are you gonna grab some bags from the window and and throw them back and keep going so we have food and and that's all? Are you gonna come down and, and sit around the table with us and laugh and maybe let us even play in the play place? As followers of Jesus, we're not just called to be good party planners or hosts or to throw dinner parties or have family dinners. Yes, feeding and being hospitable and meeting people's physical needs is part of it. But we're called to give them a meal to give them a taste of what that abundant life, that glass overflowing life looks like. That as they sit around our table, they would see something different. They would see people who are filled with grace and joy and life, and they would be hungry for that too. So what does that look like? Well, I don't know. But I do think that Mary's instructions to the servants are a great place to start. Mary said, do whatever it is he tells you. And so when it comes to your table, Do whatever it is he tells you. 
And some of us know exactly what it is that he's telling us to do. We've run into the same person 10 times and we're like, okay, God, I get the message. That's who you're telling me to have sit at my table. Or God, I know we need to leverage this table for family discipleship time. So if you know, go, do whatever it is he tells you to do. But we don't always know. And so if you don't know, ask. Say, Jesus, you have given me this house. You have given us this table. Who needs to be here? Who needs to experience a taste of the abundant life that you offer? And then wait for him to respond because he will. And here's what I know. When we do whatever it is he tells us to do, we get to be part of the miracle. The servants obeyed his ridiculous instructions. It would have made no sense to them. And they were the least important people at that party, but they were the ones who got to be a part of the miracle. Most of the people there didn't even know that Jesus performed it, but they were a part of transformation. And when we do whatever it is Jesus tells us to do, we get to be part of transformation. We get to be part of someone's story. Nothing will build your faith like that. So whose table do you love to be around? I bet it's a place where you are both fed and filled. And as great as that table is, as incredible as my grandma's table is, there is a table that is more incredible and more filling than we can ever imagine. And Jesus is inviting us to it. And he's saying, there is a seat here at my table for you. You don't have to clean yourself up to sit here. You don't have to be good enough or impressive enough or smart enough, perform well enough. You are enough because I have invited you. And he's inviting you to come and sit. And he says, at my table, there's just one rule, that you always come hungry and you always leave full because when we come to the table of Jesus, we are to come hungry, hungry for him knowing that he alone is the bread of life that can actually satisfy our deepest desires. And in him, we can experience the fullness of all that life in Jesus is. And so today we're gonna come to the table. We're gonna move into a moment of communion. This isn't a moment of ritual, but a moment of remembrance. In Mark, he writes of Jesus, for the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus served the wine at the wedding and he will serve it again to his disciples as they celebrated the last supper. And we remember when we come to this table that Jesus emptied himself so that we could be filled. That Jesus drank the cup of wrath so that we could drink the cup of joy And he knew that we would forget that he's the only thing that can actually fill us and satisfy us. So he created a table for us to come and to remember and meditate on that reality and be filled anew to be cup overflowing people. And so today we're gonna come to the table, but before we do, I just wanna take a moment here before the Lord. And if you would just ask him where it is you're looking to be filled. And if that's not in him, take a moment to repent for that. And then we'll come to the table. And if you're here today, and you've never experienced the fullness of life that Jesus offers. There's an invitation for you to come to the table, to believe and have life in his name. And so if that's you, just pray along with me. Jesus, I know that I'm empty and I've looked to so many things to fill me and none of them will satisfy. They all come up short, but today I'm gonna put my faith in you and believe that you can fill me, fill me to the full. I want a seat at your table today and forever. Amen. And God, for the rest of us, we confess our propensity to turn toward things that fill us. Would you remind our hearts now in this moment through your body and your blood 
that we are filled, that we are glass overflowing people and we live out of that fullness. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Matthew writes, so now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Today, Jesus says to us, take, eat, eat of the bread of life and be satisfied. Let's take the bread. And then he took a cup and we had given thanks. He said to them, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood, the wine of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you that I will not drink again of this fruit of the divine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Our abundant eternal life means that we will sit at a feast with Jesus for all eternity. And today we remember that his life has made purification for our sins. And so we take the cup together. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you that it went off to live lives of constantly measuring up and cleaning up and trying to fill ourselves, but that you fill us to the brim, to overflowing. I pray right now that you would move in such a way that we would live out of the abundance of what it means to be in Christ, that we would leave here as glass overflowing people. Thank you for your love, Jesus. And it's your name we pray, amen.